Hi class, um, it's August 29th, our first day of lecture, and I'm already doing a video boost. I, I suppose that's a bad sign, um, but I spent a little more time on orienting than I normally do. So what I'm going to do here is kind of go over the definition of chemistry again and give you the little history up to the point I want to be at on Wednesday. I won't do this all the time, but this material isn't material you're really going to be tested on, okay? So you can, this is sort of optional. Um, in the first class, I got to the point where I was telling the class what the definition of chemistry was, and as I normally do, or as I have for a few years, I always tell this story about my son Joseph, and when my son Joseph was six, or five or six, he was really struggling with reading. It was, a, it was kind of a big undertaking, and he would sit at the kitchen table, and he'd be trying to do his homework, and I'd be crocheting or something, trying to keep myself calm while he was learning how to read. And by the way, he's now a physics major, so he's come a long way from then. But he was very clever and he used to say very uh, interesting things to me, try to, and I think sometimes just to distract me from what I was doing or from what he was doing. And one night he was doing antonyms of words and he decides to kind of throw me off, off track by saying, Mom, what is the antonym of, a, of chemical? And I was completely thrown for a loop by this and I just sat there going, well, what would it be? Would it, would it be like antimatter? What would it be? And I'm trying to think of an answer for a six-year-old and then he quickly came in and said, Mom, there's no antonym for chemical because everything's a chemical. And I was like, yeah, Joseph, you understand the way the world works. And I thought that was a very clever answer for a six-year-old. And of course, he grew up in the chemistry world and you know, maybe he really does view everything as a chemical. But it is true that everything in the world is a chemical. Okay, And, we, and as we said, we were talking a lot about in class, you're just big reaction vessels filled with chemicals. And we want to understand how those chemicals work. Maybe I talked about that too much. Um, but the real definition of chemistry is as follows. And this is not, as I said, stuff I would actually test you on, but it's something I want you to think about as the year goes by. What is chemistry? Chemistry is the study of the composition, the uh, properties, and that is the physical properties and transformations of matter. And I really want you to think about this as you go through the course. You should constantly be thinking about this definition. I think about this definition every day of my life. Okay? What are you studying? You're studying the composition of matter. And you want to think about what does that mean, composition? Composition is how many atoms do I have? How, what are the proportion of the atoms? How are the atoms attached to each other? Okay. Um, physical properties. Uh, one of my classes was saying melting points, boiling points, solubility. Even the way molecules absorb light, those are physical properties. Physical properties often tell you about the composition or are relatable to the composition. And then finally, transformations. Very important thing. How do molecules react with each other? How does A react with B to give C? And we were talking in class about how we're going to be studying the behavior of molecules. Okay, um, the other thing I wanted to, to go through a little bit here, but keep thinking about that as we go along. I'll probably bring this up every once in a while. Um, and our course is kind of constructed along these lines. We kind of start with composition, we go to physical properties, and then we go to transformations. Um, transformations are just reactions. Okay, now, the thing I want to do is kind of boot you up with the history so that we can kind of jump right into some structural stuff on Wednesday. I won't, again, I won't do this every day. A lot of times I use these video boosts to just explain a concept better. Okay, but in the 50 minute format, sometimes we don't get it all done. All right, so um, what about history? So we were talking a little bit about history. So I was going to give you a few points in the history timeline. Or organic chemistry, uh, I usually go back to 1770. This sounds like it's going to be a very long lecture, but it's not, okay? Um, and I talk about this scientist named Torburn. What's my time? It's four and a half minutes. Okay. I think I have a lim limited time anyway. Torburn Bergman. And what I told you about Torburn Bergman is he sort of defined um, organic chemistry as being the chemistry of living systems, or that organic compounds were, were a part of living systems. So, so organic chemistry the chemistry of living systems.
And what went along with this at the time was that people believed in this um, idea known as vitalism. And vitalism in the, uh, this, this theory, all organic compounds had to be made in living systems. Is my phone going wacko? No. Okay. Um, so, th so according to vitalism, all organic compounds had to be made in living systems. And back in this time, people talked about what was called a vital force, that you needed a vital force to make organic compounds. Okay, now, as time went on, as time went on, people worked on, did various experiments, started to understand certain reactions better, and slowly but surely, this, this theory of vitalism was dispelled. So, um, the first person who started to dispel this theory was a chemist named Michel Chevrul. Okay, and what Michel Chevrul did was he took fat and he added concentrated sodium hydroxide, which back then they called lye. People still call it lye. Heat, water, and he made glycerol and fatty acids. Okay, now fat, of course, is produced in living systems, but this began to dispel the idea because, of course, he did this in a flask. He didn't do it in a living system. He took an organic molecule and converted it into other organic molecules outside of a living system. But of course the starting material came from a living system. One of the most important experiments in early, in earlier um, organic chemistry was carried out by a scientist named Friedrich Wohler. Okay. And what Friedrich Wohler did, and this, this really you might view as the first um, natural product synthesis, and a natural product is um, a compound that's found in nature, is he took um, a compound called ammonium cyanate, and using heat, he converted it into urea, and obviously urea would be a compound that people would be very familiar with because it's very abundant in urine, okay, so this is one a compound that was very easily isolated, and realize at this time, they didn't have the kind of uh, methods we have to see molecules. But at this time, they could use combustion analysis and figure out how much, how much of each element they had and in what proportion. Okay, um, So they ha did have some means to determine structure. So essentially, what he did was he took a compound that was not natural, okay, or was not produced in a living system, and is in, in fact considered to be an inorganic, compound and he converted it into a natural organic compound and again he did this in a flask and this experiment pretty much dispelled the notion of vitalism um, and it began like the the, the um, huge you know industry of making organic compounds in the laboratory and making organic compounds that are, are found in nature and someday in class we'll talk a little bit about natural products we'll probably do that a lot actually Okay, so um, a couple other little things just so we can get right into the structural part of this. Um, these are just for your interest. Um, and by the way, in your packet, I believe there is a paper, that the paper for that particular experiment for the Friedrich Wohler paper is in there, is in uh, your little packet. Um, so what else? So we go forward in history. What we really want to focus on on Wednesday is a period around 1857. Uh, a lot of stuff happened around 1857. And what happened around 1857? Um, several scientists working, in, working independent of one another developed what is called the structural theory of organic chemistry. And that's what we're going to work on on Wednesday. Okay, who were these scientists? Um, the very famous August Kekulé. 
And we're going to have lots of very interesting things to say about him. A scientist named Alexander. Um, I'm going to wait on him for a second. Archibald. There's a whole bunch of people who have similar names. Not similar, but Archibald Scott Cooper. And Alexander, I should say they all begin with A, Alexander Butleroff. Okay, so these three scientists simultaneously and independently. Now this is a common occurrence in science where multiple scientists will be working on the same idea and will come up, with, come up with their theories or their papers at around the same time. So they were competing with each other to explain the, the, the structures of organic compounds. And the explanation of organic compounds is not a simple thing. Okay. Now if you go into Wikipedia, there's a very interesting little article about um, Archibald Scott Cooper. And Archibald Scott Cooper and August Kekulé were in direct competition with each other. And Archibald Scott Cooper was preparing, he had written, as I re recollect, he wrote his paper in French, and he was preparing to um, present this paper to some French uh, chemical society. And what happened was August Kekulé scooped him, meaning he got his paper out in the public before he did. And what happened was he retired to his, he was a very wealthy Scottish um, nobleman, he retired to his country estate and apparently had a nervous breakdown because he lost this competition and he never did science again for the rest of his life. Um, you should, should certainly not feel that way. It's okay to be scooped. But back then it was probably a big thing. But what's very interesting in the little Wikipedia article is that it talks about how his paper was actually much better. It had much more detail in it. And he described, described the structures of many, many, many more compounds. Okay. Um, who else was involved in this? Well, also involved in this were two other scientists, one named um, Ale uh, Alexander Crumb Brown. I told you they all have kind of similar names. And um, the very famous Emil Erlenmeyer, which most people, most people have heard of this scientist, because what did he develop? The Erlenmeyer flask. Okay, get rid of the E there. Um, these two scientists also contributed to the structural theory. So when you come into class on Wednesday, we're going to go through the structural theory. And what is the structural theory about? Well, what, what they were trying to do is they were trying to explain the variety of organic compounds. And someone in my first lecture said that. She said, carbon is versatile. And I really like that. Carbon is versatile. Carbon is very special because of the way it bonds. And that's what we're going to talk about. And these folks had to figure this out without having any way to see the molecules. What they were discovering is that when they synthesized and or isolated organic compounds, they discovered that there were very often several compounds that had the same formula, but they had different physical properties. That means they were different compounds. These compounds that have the same formula, but have different physical properties, are what are called structural, or we'll just say are called isomers. There's another way I'm going to define this in a day or two, okay? So they, were, they, were, they had discovered this, this concept known as isomerism. And they, had, they were really hard pressed to explain the wide variety of organic compounds that they were finding. Now back then they hadn't found that many, but there were many. Today, right, I told you, we have discovered and or synthesized more than 16 million organic compounds. Okay, but back then they were constantly discovering new compounds, constantly making new compounds, burning them using combustion analysis and discovering that compounds not only had different formula, different numbers of carbons, different numbers of oxygens, different numbers of nitrogens, hydrogens, but they were also discovering that some compounds had the same formula but had different physical properties and they concluded that they were different compounds. How could they explain this? Okay, so what they did was they came up with this theory which is called the structural theory and we're going to go through the whole thing 
to explain the variety of compounds that they discovered. And interestingly enough, we still use this theory today. They did this completely, completely with their imaginations. Nowadays, when you make a compound, you can, you can actually you can see it by using spectroscopy and figure out what it is. Okay, so I'll see you in class Wednesday.